Hey, this is Billy Howardell, and you're listening to Appetite for Distortion with Brando. You know where you are. is Appetite for Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 346. My name is Brando. Today we welcome one of the co-founders of A Perfect Circle, he also had a brief stint in Guns N' Roses, which we'll get to uh, what exactly that was. But he has his first album under his own name coming out June 10th, What Normal Was. Welcome to the podcast, Mr. Billy Howardell. How are you? I'm all right. How are you doing? Where are you calling from, unless it's a secret location? Uh, secret location in L.A. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Because I'm, I'm curious, because yeah. you're, I don't want to say you're local, I'm I'm in Queens right now, and uh, you're. From, I know you're from Northern New Jersey originally, but I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know if you feel the same about New Yorkers. New Jersey is like another country to me, so I don't know where in North, Northern New Jersey you're from. Or um, it just I, depends on how far away from home you get, right? I mean, I'm I'm a local to you if we're in Istanbul. I'm sure. Right? <laughs> we're, um, yes, but uh, yeah, I mean, I would still say local enough because I would run in, you know. I might have to run to Queens to pick something up or, you know, whatever. So it wasn't that far away. But yeah, I grew up in West Milford, New Jersey, top of the state, right on the New York state border. But it was uh, not the concrete jungle. Everyone assumes New Jersey is like I like fly into Newark. You know, it was, uh, if you've, if you've been to where I grew up, it would be maybe if you went to go skiing or to action park or something like that, that was about, that was on the way, it was right. on the way to those things. Right. Yeah. Either if I have friends in New Jersey or specifically even now, um, all these big concerts that happen, maybe your next big concert is going to happen at MetLife Stadium. So always going to where the Jets and the Giants play. Um, yeah. Out of curiosity, Jets, Giants fan, do you, what are your sports allegiances? Are you a Devils fan? I mean, I grew up watching the Giants kind of, but, you know, I was, I'll age myself and say, you know, when I was a little kid, it was, well, you were either a Steelers fan or a Cowboys fan, right? It was like, uh, you were one or the other. And, uh, but locally we were the, you know, Jersey Giants would always piss off New York people. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. It's so true. I mean, technically yeah. the only New York team we have are the Buffalo Bills and that's might as well be Canada. So anyway, <laughs> we're getting, getting sidetracked here. Um, I'm excited that you are, you know, you're one of my favorite guitarists. You've been, part of not just um, a perfect circle but so many other great bands and projects i've enjoyed throughout the years so for you to do your solo thing is so it's truly special so i guess this question i don't know if it's two answers perhaps like a how long have you worked on this how long did it go from a to z to finish your solo project and also how long have you been thinking about doing it and perhaps you didn't get started for a long time i put out a solo record in 2008 under ashes divide you know, moniker, band name, whatever you want to call it. Right. But it's basically the same thing and almost like mm. the same um, roster of people working on it. So Danny Loner helped me back with that record, helped a lot more on this record. I'd say he fully co-produced this record with me. Josh Fries played drums on that. He played drums on this and I kind of took up the rest of the duties. So, um, yeah, the, the, this record started... You know, I had some songs, some basis of two or two of the songs were a little bit older, but um, or the basis of them, they weren't complete yet. But mostly in 19, like in the summer of 19, I would say the beginning of this record firmly started in July of 19. And with the hopes of getting it out end of 19 or certainly by the, by the spring of 2020. But, you know, what goes on with that. So, you know, once the pandemic hit in March, we kind of put a you know, put a delay on the record and just kind of got to tweak a little bit more than I normally would. It was an interesting thing to not have a fire, not, not having people scream at you and going, okay, we've got to finish because we got this deadline and that. I got to, um, you know, stretch it out for a few more months and just 
work with the guy who was gr- graciously mixing the record. Matty Green okay. mixed it. And I never met him in person, but we were huh. doing Zoom. You know, I would listen in real time at full fidelity in my studio and he would work in his. So it was kind of the best of both worlds. I got to be in the sonic environment I was used to. If anything needed to happen, and he said, you know, this drum part wasn't working with this guitar part. I could, li- I, I retract vocals in the middle of the mix section just for like a back backing vocal and just flew it over to him within like three minutes. And so it was a really unique situation um, to work on the end of the record like that. And he was such a troop. I mean, he was such a champ. Like he was no ego. He just wanted it to be as good as it can be. And we, you know, would mix two songs and then get to the next two, maybe two months later, because we had time at that point. And that's great that you got a, um, a good bunch of people. And we, I want to talk about Josh Freeze coming up because he's uh, been on the, on the podcast before and he's just an awesome, awesome guy. Um, you, you mentioned Ashes Divide, and I'm also going to be sprinkling some uh, some questions from listeners or comments from listeners that I got who are excited to hear from you. So you mentioned Ashes Divide. So this is from uh, my, my friend Parker up in Buffalo. Who would have thought? Uh, he What's met, up, Parker? Yeah, he met you a couple times when you were with Ashes Divide. Uh, that you were super uh-huh. super cool, very nice. So I guess to bounce off that, why make this a Billy Howardell record and not Ashes Divide, even though that was kind of a solo project? Why put this it, under your name? Yeah, it's just a name. I mean, like I said, it's, it's the same kind of uh, setup, but... I was wondering, because this record, I feel, is quite different than the first Ashes record. Now, there was a lot of time between them, so you'd expect, you know, with that many years passing that things are going to be different. But it was just so different, not just musically, but singing. And I think that um, I was toying with coming up with another band name. And then when I just thought, uh, some of this is creative and some of it is the ugly accounting of it all right it's a it's the booking agent and the manager going like this makes more sense you've done work to kind of oh. do whatever to brand this name so let's keep with ashes divide and then all of a sudden this past summer my manager just called me and said you know what i think you should use your name and i didn't swat it away i was like it's weird okay it's weird for me seeing my name on a t-shirt mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but then uh, it started to make sense. And it started to make sense because at, at this point, the record's finished. And I think it's a more personal, I think it's more personal. All songs are personal, right? I mean, they hopefully, any good story you're telling. But I think just my voice itself is a more conversational, more, um, it's more me. I think I think you could probably hear me talking and then hear me singing and know it's the same person, whereas the first Ashes record, I don't know if you would really know. Mm. If that makes sense. I mean, that's kind of one little part of this decision-making process that this is a little bit more dive into who I am, and especially musically, to go to that part. You know, this is a, uh, a love letter of sorts back to when music hit me the hardest, which is like 81 to 84 in that kind of era you know like coming into what i started to identify not just my sister's records that i was listening to and scratching up uh it was like the stuff that i was going out and buying and the culture that i was kind of like getting turned on by so this is like the record i was able to make that i couldn't make back then what that was I that make now what was that culture the music that you were listening to because i i was grateful i'm grateful enough to have gotten a sneak preview I know right now there is a, uh, a video out there for everybody to watch, uh, Poison Flowers, but I got to hear the entire uh, album. I hear a lot of new wave, you know, kind of. So what, uh, but I don't want to put any words in your mouth, any genres in your mouth. What what inspired you, I guess, musically to put this together? Yeah, musically, well, I'll go back to that time of like listening to music. I grew up in New Jersey, like I said, and New York radio was just, it was, what rose to the top is just rock, right? It mm-hmm. was like, great rock but you know and there's a lot of me that i listened to leonard skinner and and led zeppelin and you know acdc um but those were fine and great but what turned me on was all the stuff coming out of wlir mm. in garden city long island 92.7 it was like a radio station that only my mom's clock radio got that i felt like an insider to this whole 
world that didn't exist, especially in the town I grew up in. You know, I, there, there was only a handful of people that were even into these this kind of what was truly alternative back then. Alternative is such a bastardized and watered down term at this point. But, Agreed. you know, back then it was an alternative to the mainstream. And so it was all the shit they played on that station and the culture that was kind of within that station. And you heard of it, you know, I would just, what was it to go to this bar and that and, and um, that they were advertising. And, and so I just uh, quickly latched onto that. I mean, even the cure, which is so like at this point to say, like you were a fan of, you were a fan of the cure sounds almost pedestrian at this point, but it certainly <laughs> wasn't, you know, I know and, what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So for me that like, to right around that time was like 17 seconds and pornography and Japanese whispers and all these great records that and killing joke. Um, and you know, even just the things that were a little left of center, but just had this other worldliness to them. So that's kind of what made me tick and made me want to pick up a guitar. Really. Very cool. And I don't know if you've seen this documentary about WLAR called. I did. I'm in it. Oh, I've seen it. I don't remember you for some reason. Silly me. Yeah, I'm in, I'm, I'm in it that short. Dare to be different. Remember? Dare to be different. Yeah. Oh, wow. Geez. Yeah, they reached out to me because I've talked about this before, and um, yeah, I went and got interviewed for that. I got a little. I did watch it. I loved it. I I watched the whole thing. I thought silly. it was a great documentary. It is because I'm a silly me. Maybe I've just burned one too many brain cells. You know, I'm just you know blondie sticking out of my head and all, like, all the interviews that they've done. But because I'm friendly with uh, Dennis McNamara. Who's been uh -huh, on? Cool. Um, who was the PD back then? We did an interview maybe like um, a couple of years ago. He was the guest co-host while we interviewed Mike Peters of the Alarm, another big band of that uh, that era. Maybe you yeah. I don't know if you're an, an Alarm fan. So that's really cool. Yeah, especially yeah. and it's so yeah. funny seeing that documentary and like I, speaking of Josh Freeze, when we're out doing stuff, you when you're a kid. I assumed everyone that was a rock star is just being delivered and they, they get woken up out of a coffin, <laughs> put into a limo, driven to the gig and then put back in that, you know, storage unit or whatever coffin they're in. <laughs> and then when you go see in this documentary, I'm assuming Dennis McNamara and Malibu Sue and all the, yeah. like, those are rich people living in mansions. And then you look at the documentary and some shitty, you know, drop ceiling nightmare <laughs> place they're in and, and you go like, oh, I'm actually glad I didn't know that, but we were <laughs> we're we were fortunate to grow up in a time when you just had to let your imagination run wild as to what these things were, and things were larger than life. And now you're everything's on TV, quote unquote, so to speak. Right. Everyone's on Instagram, and you get to see everyone's what they you know what can have for their appetizer. And um, yeah, it was just a different thing. I think that's why music might have stung even harder for us back then. And because we didn't flip the channel, so to speak, we stuck with the record and it, it absorbed and it became the soundtrack to your summer or the, you know, the, the thing that you bonded with somebody going, oh, fuck, you know, you've heard this before. Like, you know, wow. you're in my club, fool. <laughs> just, just knowing that you were one of the kids listening to WLAR, and, and being influenced by that is just so cool. And and look at me telling you about the documentary that you're in. I mean, geez. I know. No, <laughs> this is that, maybe it's half a, embarrassing <laughs> for you, half embarrassing for me. No, I mean, that's, I made that much of an impact. Really, really, uh, I, it's, it's not the first time, though the, though the last time I forget uh, something. I'm professional, I swear. Maybe it's, oh, this, this is the nice segue uh, to your back to your album. What normal was? Maybe everything pre-pandemic I forgot when things were normal. That's my 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 terrible segue. Um, so what what inspired? I guess what normal was? It's not about the pandemic, I assume, or was it about your youth? Because you mentioned that. What struck? You know, why that title? There's, you know, there is a duality to it, and there's many facets, right? I mean, insert what you will, right? I mean, that's what music is. I'm not going to tell you what it has to be. I mean, there was a driving force for the reason the name started with with that, and then there's evolution, and it started to become okay. There's a couple there's a there's a couple intersections that made sense, so that that title was uh, even better than the one I had before, which I actually really liked. Which I won't tell you because I might use it again. <laughs> but um, yeah. I'm, you know, there's part of this record that I'm giving you an insight to what normal was for me, you know, and that normal was, you know, 
it, it's a positive thing. I, I, I mean, I, I, I guess it does sound pretty negative, pejorative, whatever you want to say, hearing it nowadays. But um, I do look at it like a flashback to a time of like what got me so jazzed to get into this. You know, like it's truly a love letter, this, this record for me. So if this, you know, since this is a love letter, you know, what's the, I guess, chapter, a.k.a. track uh, that you feel shows, are you maybe shows your emotion the most or you're most excited for people to hear or read the lyrics, hear the lyrics and, and interpret it in their own way? Or is there maybe a track or two that you're most excited for the world to hear? It's so hard. I mean, this, this record in particular, you know, you were always, everyone works hard to make a good album, right? I hope. And then there was times back in those days, right, when people were like, you need one or two hits and don't care if you, you know, crap on the floor for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. This, every every song has a purpose and every every song is particularly made to fit in a sequence. And um, so I'm hoping people hear this as one 40 whatever minute, um, you know, experience, right? But um, it depends who's asking. I, I, if you're asking my friend's aunt. I'm going to play her a different song than I'm going to play to my kid's friend. Um, so, you know, I'm uh, Poison Flowers was released first. It was kind of meant to be a reintroduction to Hey, Remember Me, and that this has some connective tissue to the to what I've done, what I've put out in the past, and where I'm going. You know, mm. uh, but there's, I don't know. I, I, I'm a little now influenced by some peers saying like they've got a favorite track. So I don't even, I don't even want to say, I don't know. Okay. I, I, I'd say them all, you know, like I want you to start with track one. I, you know, there's a reason, there's a reason why the record does sound kind of, you know, there's an evolutionist record from certainly from one to nine and then 10 kind of whips you back into shape. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. I kind of going back to, you know, back then where you really maybe didn't have a choice you know, maybe to select singles and pick whatever you want, but you would just go home and put on a, you know, vinyl, a cassette, you know, a track, whatever, and you just listen to it from the beginning to the end. And that's certainly, uh, that is this record. So I, I certainly, that's the way I listen to it. Uh, what normal yeah. was, uh, coming out again, uh, June, June 10th. So let me ask though, since you, you know, you thought about maybe going under another band name and you, you know, decided to go under your own name. Does that make the approach to writing any different? Uh, maybe even versus how you are with the perfect circle or you, how, I guess, how is the writing process for you in this project versus others? Probably similar. Um, I'm glad I didn't know it was coming out under my name when I started it. It's nice that it happened after the record was done, to be honest, because I never thought that a bit. Um, because that seems so grand, like it, it for me, at least in theory, and now I'll never know because now it'll be just the second record I make and which would be much easier. But just to, to go, oh God, this is under my name. It's got to be X, Y, and Z. And I don't even know what Z is. Hmm. Um, but now, uh, looking back at the process, I mean, it's similar. I, I have sketches of things that I like and I feel like they go in this folder and some of those things I might present to Maynard as APC tracks and some I might keep for what I think is something that I'm thinking there's a, there's a story to tell um, lyrically. Because with APC songs, I don't, I don't present him with, I don't present him with any hard idea of, of uh, lyrics or a story. And I make the working titles very generic and almost impossible to latch onto. Although Manor has kept a few working titles. Okay. And, <laughs> I think it was just accidental or it just happened to be a, you know, yeah, just happy accident. And uh, again, I'll, I'll bring up Josh Freeze later, but when we spoke to him, one of the working titles he told me, maybe he'll tell me more about it, was Smells, Smells Like Josh Spirit for Chinese Democracy. And I mean, <laughs> it's just brilliant. But I, yeah. since you, you mentioned Maynard and you're obviously singing on this record. Is there any pressure for you? Because Maynard is regarded as one of the best vocalists. I mean, you obviously have a great voice, but you, you never know when someone is in a band with this very well-known vocalist and they step aside and it's not quite the same vocals. Um, is there any pressure there or this is just, this is your voice and, and this is 
who you are. So it, it doesn't matter. Not, not on this record, really, honestly. But in 2008, yes, okay. I felt the pressure big time. I felt it because, you know, it was, you know, APC, we had three records come out in within four years. And then I started working on Ashes. And I definitely felt like what the, you know, anything I do possibly is going to sound if I do have any sound, so to speak, of my writing style or playing, it's going to come through and it's going to be without Maynard and how's that going to be received? And I was definitely thinking about it back then. This time, no, I didn't. I can tell you, honestly, I didn't feel that way. And I think, and Maynard even, I hesitate even telling this because it, it's like, I, I guess I'm good at um, talking you out of things and accepting a defeat i could talk you out of anything i've made if you want but um <laughs> okay but he, but maynard's suggestion to me and this was 2006 maybe is just using your speaking voice almost like his and you have to read between the lines of what that means right okay but i, I or i would i think that whoever hears that you have to kind of go okay but that doesn't mean just make a spoken record um, but I think that's what I did. I mean, I kind of just took that and ran with it this time. And because your voice is your voice. And, but if you're trying to do a character, you might be chasing something else. Now, you know, I like acting too. You know, I get it what it is to go and do a character and just bring your own thing to that character. But this time, I don't feel like I'm doing a character. This is just kind of where it naturally falls. And hence, again, why it made sense to use my name. So you know, the mechanics of singing, let's say, I worked to make sure that I'm singing in the register that was the right register for me singing the song, not that I wanted to impress you that I'm hitting a B flat mm. in whatever octave. Okay. I like that. Yeah. that's It's very keeping it simple and just being yourself and not trying to extend it and making something, becoming something that you're not. But I guess yeah. even though you're staying in your own pocket, are there... Um, maybe it's going back to your childhood now, going back to the LAR days, are there singers and vocal styles that maybe inspired you? Maybe that you weren't mimicking or trying to act like, but maybe they, they inspired you to um, become, not necessarily on this record, but just sing in general, I guess. Yeah, completely. I mean, the first things that I heard that I, well, there's singing kind of in the shower. And then when you hmm. first start driving, you know, it became like, 17 and got my car, got my stereo, and then you're in your own domain and you can do whatever you want, right? And I, I think I found the singers that I felt like I could sing or wanted to. And um, it wasn't always my favorite music, you know? It was just, uh, I tend to like female vocals a lot. And that was one of the things Maynard and I bonded on is like a kind of a feminine approach to heavier atmospheric music you know, that, that we bring that part of ourselves to the picture. And um, with with early singing and trying to find out where my voice was, I mean, Neil Finn from Crowded House was kind of one of the first that I felt like I, I could sing kind of high and he has a higher register, and it, but it felt fun to do. And, um, and singing, you know, Roger Waters parts on the wall, that was another, I think, thing to let you just get a little unhinged. It's so untraditional and um, emotional and you can really just get lost within that. I think those are the things that really sparked it. But, you know, there's Bowie. Um, yeah, there's many things. But I mean, the, the things I listened to and turned me on were always things I was trying to chase. Some of them were so sacred that I didn't want to touch them. Mm. You know, a lot of the music that I listened to, like Elvis Costello, I, I'd have to say that that was my biggest influence or I was the biggest fan of if you went in my bedroom as a kid it was half littered with Elvis Costello vinyl all over the walls and then Blue Oyster Cult covers and hmm. Killing Joke and you know it was kind of a mixture of uh, a lot of things but I mean Elvis was the biggest for me but he never made the sec same record twice and I wasn't really going to try and sing that guy's thing I mean it's you know Talk about personal. It's like very, very uh, unique. And I don't know anyone that sounds like him. No one. 
No one at all. <laughs> I can't think of anyone yeah. either. Um, to switch gears a little bit, we've mentioned him a couple times. How far back do you go with, with Josh Freeze? How long have you two been, I guess, friends and also making music together? When we, when Maynard and I start very, very beginnings of talking about working together, he told me about Josh because he had, I think Josh was playing with Devo on some festival that Tool was on. And when I was, we were talking about drummers, he said, we got to get this wise ass kid. That's amazing. And uh, this little punk rock kid. Um, Josh is like, what, like a year or two younger than me, but somehow he was a kid. You know, when you're 20, when you're 27, two years is a big deal. Um, and then I started working for GNR as a tech and um, I met Josh there. I met Josh uh in 97 because he came down to audition to be the drummer for gnr and i was playing bass for the drum auditions when duff was just starting to uh kind of gently roll out of the picture so um that's funny that i didn't put it together till after and then Maynard said yeah that's the kid that i'm talking about playing on your songs you know <laughs> so, wow it's funny it kind of came together that way that's crazy so you know what this is a nice tie-in you so you're you started as a, a tech for guns and roses so as i i guess i go back to sprinkling fan questions i want to make sure i credit my listeners who want to say hello to you uh this is from mark griffin on on twitter how did you get the gig with gnr like when did you join and so was it not part of the band were you helping out if you can just tell us about how you got into axel's world I was called, Robin Fink from Nine Inch Nails called me. So I was a tech with Nine Inch Nails working. I was Trent's guitar and keyboard tech on the road. And that was 94 and five. 96, I went on to work with Bowie because they, you know, we toured together and then I just continued on with Bowie. Um, I saved up enough money to go and give a crack at recording my own songs at that point. So that's what I set out to do. I was like, I, I found a spot. I moved in with Maynard. You know, it was a chance kind of re, a bumping in of to Maynard at a bar when I was looking for a place to stay. And it just kind of worked out. And at that time, Robin calls me. So that's like 97 now. And um, said, hey, I got this crazy call. I got a call to go down and play with Guns N' Roses. And they want like unique sounds. And that was kind of my angle. Like I was you know, good at programming, interesting guitar sounds. And, and back then it was hard to do, you know, back then it was like the gear was complex. You had a lot of hurdles to jump over. So he just called me up to do that. And it was like, I was like, okay, we kind of laughed about it. It was so going from Nine Inch Nails tour and then being called to do Guns N' Roses was just so odd and different. I mean, I, I, even though now you could see they, they operate in the same universe, but it just didn't, it felt interesting <laughs> to say the least. So I went down there, hit it off. Um, Axel and I hit it off uh, right away. And by like, it was only supposed to be like two or three days that I was down there. And um, he asked me to stay on. And I kind of reluctantly, I wasn't trying to play hardball for any reason other than I really wanted to do, you know, my music. And um, I was 26 or 27 at the time. I'm like, this is, this is when I got to do it. And, he was really gracious in that he, I was a guitar tech, but I was getting, I was starting to record with a computer at home. They were not into the computer thing yet. They were still recording on uh, these DA88 or whatever the you know, VHS cassettes that you did multi-tracks on. Okay. And so he um, brought me in to kind of bring, you know, shepherd them into that realm, but me learn it at the same time. So in a way, Axel was very gracious in giving me the opportunity, like believed in me enough to help bring them into the, the computer world, I'd say, or rec computer recording idea, but also work on his sounds and with him. And, you know, it was just kind of an ever evolving position. And, um, and then it turned into me working with him at, you know, during the nights, let's say, and the band working with the producer during the day. And, and uh, yeah, it was just, it was an interesting process. And it was a lot of, a lot of exploration, a lot of unknowns and a lot of um, 
you know, throwing a lot of money and effort at trying to make a great record. Uh, for sure. And that's why it's so great when we speak to people like Josh Freeze or you, who we learn so much more about. There's plenty of things, obviously, to talk about, but just that that small little time capsule when you were in Guns N' Roses, people are still th thirsty to hear about because we didn't, we didn't know about it. We didn't know what was going on. It's such a, a mystery. So, and, and I also understand some mysteries are meant to be not, are, are meant to remain mysteries. So this is another sure. question. If you want it to remain a mystery, that's fine. Uh, this is from Marco also on Twitter. Um, he knew that you were also a part of the auditions for a drummer playing bass during those, um, around the time Duff was leaving. You may not be able to discuss who auditioned, but if you can talk about maybe who auditioned as drummer or maybe some names that we don't know, if you want to tell us, great. If not, I completely understand. I'll put it that way. They were big. They were big names. You know, there were some great players, and that just goes to show that Josh. There were great players that were impressive and awesome. But the fact that Josh rolled in—I don't know if you know this story. Josh, again, this is the first day I met him was the day he rolled in for that audition. He was jet setting with some other band, just flew in from London to do this audition. And there's a famous, I don't know if it's still there, but there's like a sushi bar right in London Heathrow at the terminal. He had sushi and got, I guess a bad, bad something and got food poisoning. So he's poor bastard, like got on the plane, got food poisoning. He shows up to the audition quite green mm -hmm. and throwing up in the bathroom and, you know, and still killed it. I mean, it was just a pretty, in my mind, and I think in everyone else's, it was a, it was a, it was a clear choice for who was going to do that, you know, who's going to fill those shoes. So it was just amazing that Josh at his worst is still a, a force to be reckoned with. Literally showing Axel his guts. Uh, that's my, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's my, dream. hopefully not showing, but hearing about it. <laughs> hearing, yeah. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I've seen a few. That's, um, yeah. that's, I mean, that's fantastic. And, and yeah, and I know, um, I guess that leads to, we, we spoke to Josh about his departure and we know you, you were, you were never part of the band cause you were trying to make your own sound. And I completely respect that. Cause sometimes when you're young and you're throwing this big band in your face and you have this paycheck, you can be something, but you had your own path, which yeah. is super cool. So I guess how did maybe your exit leave with Josh and like the perfect, circle thing happened because it you know it was just another band another great band formed out of guns and roses almost it was just very interesting yeah. how that happened yeah i mean in the end of 98 minor and i really started focusing on starting to record songs and and um again axel was very supportive of like whatever he can do to to help it along and, and i really appreciated that and um he was always a great supporter of what you know we were doing and um and then uh come 99 i don't know spring of 99 maynard said there's this festival or this benefit coming up at the viper room i'm gonna book it and we don't even have enough songs to play but it's gonna force us to do it you know an un unrealistic deadline that's gonna put a fire under our ass so that's what we did. And then started putting together a live band and, and really flushing out these songs. At that time, maybe there were six. And, um, and so that's what it did. And I, so my departure was inevitable coming to um, September. I think it was like September 2nd or September 9th. I kind of remember of 99 when I just finally said, I'm, you know, it's, I've got to go. I wanted to see that record through. I really believed in the project. I didn't want to, um, you know, cut out of there, but it was a time when I had to make a hard decision. And so I had to go. And yeah, it was, uh, you know, the, the timing was just right for that. So um, yeah, it was an exciting time. I mean, and then from that moment forward, from September on, it was just a whirlwind of, hmm putting more show. We did a little club run as APC doing really small clubs, you know, sort of like what I'm embarking on now <laughs> going out. It, it, like I got a U.S. tour starting June 10th with this thing. And um, yeah, it was interesting. It was just like doing little clubs and then we got a record deal, finished the record in December slash January and then uh, on the road with nails and it just everything kind of clicked. You know, everything kind of came together. 
Amazing. And I will have a couple of um, perfect circle questions or APC questions before uh, we get out of here. And, and of course, uh, circle back to the uh, speaking of circle back to the album. I'm full of puns because you also said there was a time and I got to talk about there was a time twat. And this is from uh, another uh, question from a, a listener on uh, this also on Twitter, Mr. Pink. Axel told in the chat forums, because back in the days, Axel actually used to go on these uh, crazy fan forums, that he was very proud of the orchestration in Twat. There was a time. As you worked on that song, what can you tell us about it? I don't remember. I mean, it, there was, uh, God, so long ago. Let's do the math. Was that 25 years ago? In 2008, um, yeah. Uh, oh, well, no, but well, when well, oh, making up, I like, see, if I was there in 97, or, let's say that song was 98, 99, that, yeah, at least 24 years ago. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. like, fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, are there, I know sometimes it's, I feel silly because we're all fans that remember all these things and we, we listen to the same songs and over and over again. And obviously this, you're so far removed from this project. But is there any song maybe that you um, can recall off that record that you had, had your hand in and you were particularly proud of that you uh, that you do remember? I don't okay. honestly. I was okay. you know I was a digital. I was basically well. I, we used Logic, but I was call it a Pro Tools engineer for it's, it's almost like a way for if you don't know what that is, it's you know a digital audio editor. Sure. But I really was. Therefore, Axel, if he needed, you know, was going to sing or were kind of exploring other ideas, you know, there was a lot of shooting the shit too. You know, it was a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, socializing that happens to kind of get you into that place. So there was, there was just a lot, there was a lot that went into getting the final takes to be what they are. By the time I left, I think they did so much to unroot re-record readdress so many things um so i i don't know there was foundational things that i was around for Understood. but i don't know i feel i feel like everything was kind of turned over several more times the soil was turned over several more times and more seeds were planted and it's a garden that i can barely recognize you know? yeah yeah well well said i like that um that analogy and kind of the same with josh freeze you know asking him what he had his hands in and no, it's a long time ago, but just trying to find out and then uncover any rock we can about this mysterious album is appreciated. So uh, no worries, but perhaps you have a better memory about uh, Mare de Gnomes. This is from uh, Mr. Mac, and I, I can't say it better than I than he did. It's a fucking masterpiece. Tell him that. The finest drum sound ever. Fact. <laughs> is there anything you can tell us about recording that album, which I, I guess have, have to say... One of the first albums I ever played on the radio. I did, since you're in New Jersey, maybe you're familiar with Hofstra. I did, started radio uh, in Hofstra and playing, you know, rock and heavy metal. And I played the shit out of a perfect circle when that record came out. Cool. So Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember, I mean, different than GNR where I was, you know, working for, I'm in service to the band, you know, APC, Maynard sang on it, but I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I was sort of a sort of a one man operation in that I'm, you know, engineering, producing, cutting the checks, you know, like, it, especially in the beginning, it was the, all the money I had saved being a tech or working for GNR or working on the road. I kind of did to buy gear, buy everybody lunch, go rent a rehearsal place, go rent a re place to record. Um, I recorded most of it at the rental house that Manon and I rented. It was a little pottery room off of a detached garage, you know, little, you know, rat infested shit hall. <laughs> but I, I, you know, that was part of the thing. I went to Home Depot and just kind of soundproofed it and made it my own little room. It was like, I don't know, maybe nine feet across by 12 feet long. Um, and then there was a little, little other room de uh, detached from it that that was the vocal booth per se. And so, yeah, I recorded the whole record there at my place, except for the drums. And the, record, the drums were recorded over the course of, I said two days, it might be four days in total. But it was, um, call it two days at my friend Scott Humphrey's house, who he had a, a killer, when I say home studio, it's deceiving. It was like a professional recording studio in a Hollywood Hills mansion. Mm. 
And they were just doing the Tommy, Tommy Lee was just doing his methods of mayhem record. And, and, uh, also, uh, Rob zombie, Hellbilly deluxe, Great album. um, was being done right there at the same time. So it's like the same drum setup and everything there. They actually used my bass on that record. I was like proud to offer it. <laughs> I like Hellbilly Deluxe is, is awesome. It I, is. I still think of that record as like exciting jump out of the speakers tracks. Right on. And, uh, yeah. 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 It's killer. I played that too. College radio. Yeah. That's my, that era was my wheelhouse when I started doing, uh, doing what I'm doing, but that's, uh, yeah. For, Put on Super Beast, and if your blood pressure doesn't go, you know, like that doesn't get you hyped. <laughs> I don't know, you know, get your ticker checked. But um, so anyway, that's we recorded half of Merda Noms on that Tommy Lee kit at their place. It was kind of all set up, all ready to go. But you know, just took the tracks and I just readjusted them at home. And then the other half of the tracks, literally the other six, were done at Sound City, the famous Sound City Studios, um, and. There's a definite, I can name you the, the songs that were at each place and they're very different, you know, um, the different sound and the song Brenya was split between the two. Mm. The beginning of Brenya was tracked at Scott's place on that Tommy Lee kit. And then you'll hear the transition of like at the guitar, well, I call it a guitar solo, but I mean, I've never really played solos, but that, that, that like the three quarter mark, the drums open up and that's a Sound City recording. And I just kind of blended them together um and it just became this epic thing uh yeah so that's kind of the recording process we started mixing at uh ben gross's studio in burbank he had a power outage and we moved on to ecstasy which was called one-on-one -on -one also where they did the metallica black album in north hollywood and we finished the mix there and alan Mulder mixed the record so yeah i can literally visualize a lot from sure. that that time of the technical recording just a brilliant record and a brilliant band. Um, quickly, any oh, future plans for APC? Um, no hard plans right now, but talks of talks of talks of a plan. <laughs> I got you. Yeah. I got you. Well, you got to focus yeah. on, your, on your stuff first. So, uh, with exactly, that, and I yeah. could be. I mean, I've got things in the incubator or sitting in folders that are ready to, you know, explore and give to Maynard and see what his musical conversation is going to say about them, and then. But, you know, he's doing push for, but he's out with Tool right now, about to do push for in about a month or less. And then, you know, when we're done there and we're, you know, um, we will maybe reconvene and, you know, turn over more APC stones and see where that goes. Exciting. But in the meantime, you're kicking off your, your tour all over the United States. It kicks off uh, June 11th in Ventura, California. You're going to be... Uh, my Neck of the Woods, Gramercy Theater in the middle of July, but go to BillyHowardell.com. All the dates are there. The, the record is is brilliant. I'm glad that you're putting it out under your – I'm glad you're putting it out under, under your name because I know you weren't sure, but I don't know. It's got to be more of a household name. I want Billy – Howardell. I don't know. It could be like uh, the Howardell Hotel. Maybe you have something else in your future. <laughs> Just get, put it out there yeah. more. I, I love hey, it. Hey, I'll brag a little and say I can cook. I'll, I'll, I'll just, that'll be the name of my restaurant, the Howard Bell Hotel. <laughs> just, he just saved me a lot of hard, you know, yeah. hard decisions right there. Yeah. Like a Billy's breakfast. Okay. I, I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting carried away here. No, me. I'm down. Okay. I'm down. All right. Fair enough. Well, yeah. just um, get, get me a uh, free bacon, egg and cheese whenever I come in. That's all I ask for. Thank you. Uh, okay. On that awkward note, <laughs> that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. Thank you so much, Billy. I hope we get to do this again. Cool. Yeah, Sam. Thanks for having me, and uh, we'll see you all out there in a couple of months, in less than a month and a half. Thank you so much, Billy. I really appreciate your time. You were yeah. really cool, and uh, sir, I hope we get to do this again. Yeah, thanks for spreading the word, man. I, you, I mean, thanks. You got it. You take care. All right. Take okay. care. Bye. Bye, bye. Really cool, dude. Sometimes I feel silly, you know, you're asking about, and they know, you're asking about these experiences that they had, you know, 20 years ago. And unlike us who are diehard GNR fans, they might not remember all the particulars and they rack their brain, but we, we do what we can. And I do what I can. I mean, you know what? Sometimes I ask some really poignant questions. And then there are other times I, I like, oh, did you see this documentary that 
you were in? <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. You know what, though? I don't mind screwing those up. I used to really kick my butt about it. And, and obviously, I don't like making stupid mistakes and things that, you know, escape to me. Because, yeah, I'll do research. Uh, I don't know everything. I don't have a producer. I don't have a co-host to help me out. Um, but all those are excuses. But it just happens so often during my interviews in my career where it's just it's professional, I'm doing well, and I just make this kind of, you know, boner, for lack of a better word, for a mistake. And it's just like, oh, my goodness. But I think it makes the guest laugh. It reminds me of, I mean, it's happened a lot during the podcast, to be honest with you. I don't know if that's part of my, my thing to be half professional, half idiot. But when I was, uh, the interview with Nancy Wilson, when she was talking about the song that she did with Taylor Hawkins and Duff McKagan, it was something like, dancing in the neon uh, ballroom and I said just very casually in the bathroom and she waited for me to finish my sentence before correcting me and, and we both started laughing I'm just like oh my god I can't believe I just said that and she's laughing and you know what I think it just brings a guard down to an interview and just really makes it humble because yeah if I could react to it you know being real shameful and over apologizing and and making it awkward my awkwardness is sincere. I don't want to go up and beyond and, and just make it really dumb. I, but, so you heard Billy and I just kind of laughed at it and, and moved on. Acknowledged, <laughs> acknowledged my, 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 my boner, which sounds weird out of context. Look it up, kids, because I know a lot of uh, you who listen to this podcast speak multiple languages. Boner has several meanings. I don't know why. I'm, I'm stuck on that word today. Anyway. Uh, a lot of fun. I love doing this podcast. Thanks to all of you. I appreciate you allowing me to make these mistakes. And if you ever hear any, I mean, I always appreciate the constructive criticism, the compliments. You know, we'll do it in a Mr. Mailstone segment in the future. Hit me up on social media, Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter. That's how the conversation continues in between the broadcasts. Uh, email as well, the AFD show at gmail.com. And, and I said I wanted to take a slight break from episodes as I I'm not really healing at this point from my my missing tooth uh, I felt like I really heard it in the interview with with Billy but again I don't want to call attention to it like I just did I'm not getting the screw uh, for my implant for my tooth until I think August and then it's gonna be a couple months after that and that's gonna be need time to heal for when they put the implant in so I'm still gonna be a even during my wedding, I'm going to be a toothless freak. Uh, I mean, I do have a, you know, a uh, fake to put in there for pictures and stuff. But, yeah, that's that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it is what it is. But these interviews keep kind of popping up. I reached out about Billy Howardell earlier this year. Uh, when I could still, you know, I, I had a, a chip tooth in where it wasn't that bad. Not knowing that I was going to maybe want to take a break. And it just kind of happened. You know, uh, same thing with Vivian Campbell. So we'll see. I don't have any interviews planned just yet. I know I want to start cooking on the uh, Guns N' Roses fan, uh, fan reviews when they start um, on the tour. But as far as upcoming guests, I don't know yet. I don't know at this current moment. But, I mean, look at the ones that have just come out of nowhere. I say I'm going to take a break. Uh, and then I get George Thurgood, Tony Harnell, Eric Dover. And Vivian Campbell. So <laughs> uh, maybe it's a good thing for me not to know because that's when we get great guests. We always get great guests. So, again, if you wanted to, uh, to suggest one, but pretend, potentially be a, a guest co host, hit me up on any of the platforms that I mentioned before, you know, social media. Uh, you can leave reviews, you can leave it in there. I'm always, I see everything. Again, I'm a one man band here. I see wherever you leave the comment, if it's on iHeartRadio, if it's on YouTube. Uh, again, uh, trying to get up those YouTube uh, followers, which, which are happening. Very cool. I, I'm having a lot of fun curating this YouTube channel and going through past interviews and just putting up uh, just fun interview clips of, of things that we haven't listened to in a long time. Or if you don't have, let's just say if you don't want to listen to the whatever is the entire hour plus of Tony Harnell, I have clips up there of Tony talking about Axl Rose and talking about how uh, Skid Row and how he almost replaced Rob Halford in uh, Jewish Priest and, 
And that made a blabbermouth. So I'm, I'm trying to make some bite-sized bites for you, for those of you who can't dedicate an hour or so to these, uh, these episodes. So I'm uh, doing what I can for you. I'm the man of the people. Anyway, that does it for this episode of Appetite for Distortion. When will you see the next one? Well, the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy. You'll see it. I don't know. As soon as the word. Security, I'm going home.